Susan Hendricks, a blockbuster development in the double murder case of two young girls from Delphi, Indiana. Liberty German and Abigail Williams, Abby and Libby, brutally murdered in the middle of the day, a day off from school in 2017. A crime that shocked the nation, leading investigators down a winding road of evidence with the ever-present question, who killed Abby and Libby? And now we move one step closer to possibly finding the answer. The Indiana State Police announcing they have this man in custody, have charged him with two counts of murder, 50-year-old Richard Allen from Delphi. Here is State Police Superintendent Doug Carter. I am proud to report to you that today, actually last Friday, was the day and an arrest has been made. Thanks to literally hundreds of media outlets that have been steadfast in reporting and keeping the memories of Abby and Libby front and center. Many of you in the room have developed relationships with me personally, and you know I always have a personal perspective, and today's no different. But from a very personal perspective, you have provided, you all have provided, inspiration and support, even while oftentimes frustrated with us and me. You continue, but you continue to encourage the efforts, and you too believe that one day we would all be here participating and sharing this news. To the entire law enforcement community, which includes all local, state, and federal agencies, which are far too many to specifically mention today, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Certainly a stunning news conference. What was said and what was left out. We're going to break down today's major developments and many questions with our expert panel. But first, I do want to bring in Mike and Becky Patty, Libby's grandparents, who I've been lucky enough to have gotten to know through the years. It's good to see both of you. Becky, I'll start with you. We've discussed many times on maybe what this day would be like for you. What did it feel like and was it different than what you thought? Oh, much different. I've always told people that uh, when we were told that they'd hear me yelling from the rooftops and uh, when they told us it was really just kind of like, oh, uh, reality um, was much different than what I totally expected. Almost, Becky, like from what you've described through the years. We've been on panels together. You've handed out flyers. You've said, we have to find this person. Uh, so this is moving on to, I guess, a new chapter, Becky. Yes, um, yes. I uh, got up the next morning and got my coffee and got ready to post my today is the day and realized that uh, um, well, I, I don't have to do this anymore. So I think that's when some of reality set in and, I, and I'm thinking, now, now what do I do? What is my purpose? Um, we're finding our feet there, figuring out what it is we have to do. And I guess we're preparing for the next path we have to go down. And Mike, you've said throughout the years, look, I don't want to get my hopes up too much in terms of certain names, uh, persons of interest, if you will, that have been tossed around. So when you heard this, was your thought, okay, I'm not gonna jump to conclusions here until I hear it? <clears throat> yeah, we definitely didn't jump to any conclusions, but I, I think the the reality of it, like I said, is, is still setting in with us. And more importantly, trying to figure out what our path forward is. I mean, and that is, the prosecution of, of the case and so what role do we play there we're still big advocates you know in helping the investigative team out there and driving in information because um, we're we want to make sure that if there's anything that's out there that the law enforcement doesn't know about we want them to know about it and I especially with with this arrest and, and this person being charged with this um, if there's people out there that have anything that's that's ties to this with this new information and a new person you know, there's a face with the bridge guy now and a name with the bridge guy um, to please call that information in because this could definitely jar some memories from other people who may have had interactions with him 
And as you both have heard with the prosecutor, McClellan, he has said through the years, look, um, what we think and what we know are two different things. And we not only have to make an arrest, we do want to make sure the person who's responsible for this does go away for a long period of time, meaning a guilty verdict. And Mike and Becky, I've seen the both of you, we've been on panels together, just the hope you bring to other people who have gone through maybe a crime, an unsolved crime, and just what you've been able to do together in moving forward. And you've always kept Abby and Libby's memory alive. And I know this so well, and I've said to you before, Becky, this is so much more than a case. It's two young girls. And uh, Becky, you said this year was difficult. Every year, of course, is. But the milestones, Becky, graduating from high school, I remember you telling me about a parking spot um, that she was unable to get. So the wounds are deep, and it's ongoing, right? Oh, most certainly. Um, you, you feel it, you live it every day. Uh, Kelsey's wedding, you know, e every event, vacations. She may not be here physically, but we take her with us. We take her with us everywhere we go and whatever we do. A lot of what we do, a lot of our vacations is based around on honoring Libby. And Mike, when you were at the press conference, I know you were uh, briefed beforehand what were your thoughts going through? I know that you've been uh, great with law enforcement, always backing them and them backing you, and they thanked you immensely for this. And they said, look, the tip line's still open. And that means that, look, this is not case closed, right, Mike? You are correct, it's not. We wanna make sure that we have, you know, look under every rock um, and check every, every lead, any information that's out there. I've said this, the, the police don't know what they don't know. And I'm asking for, again, the public's help and let's just keep the pressure on this. You know, keep their foot on the accelerator. Let's drive this all the way to a closure. I mean, we, we, we got another hill to climb in front of us. You know, we, we've we made it to the top of one. Now we got another one in front of us and let's, uh, we're here. We're not going anywhere. We're gonna, we're gonna make it to the top of the next hill as well. And Becky, how is Tara doing and Anna doing and, I'm sure you lean on each other. Um, yes, we we all went in. We we waited. We went in together. Uh, we try to do it as a united front because that's what we are. In the end, we're all a united front. We're all in this together. We're all after one thing. And I know that you've been working tirelessly almost six years. Um, to get the word out and saying, look, it just takes one minute. I know that you've talked about Libby and the post-it notes and saying, give me one minute, and that's what she always said. Um, have you felt her through these last couple of days? Um, I guess the question is, what well, have you been thinking about in yeah. terms of, <laughs> of Libby? Well, I, I think that, uh, I mean, I know Kelsey has, and, and I know I know Beck has, we all have. Um, and the fact that, you know, that, that we kind of met this this goal, right? The first goal was, was to get somebody arrested, get the, get the investigative team enough information so they could make the arrest. Now we just have to, to uh, you know, drive the information in to, to make that stick and get the prosecutor now. I mean, we're, we're kind of switching modes. We're not only help law enforcement, but now we're going to make sure we help the prosecutor. But uh, and knowing that, I think Libby knows now that, that we're down here working hard, and I'm sure she's looking down on us and, and knowing how hard that we've, we've put a lot of effort, you know, in the last five and a half years into this. And uh, I'm sure she's smiling on us. And I feel that too, Mike she and Becky. Is. Thank you so much. It's just been such an honor to get to know you both, and I know the strength has to continue. And we're thinking about you constantly. Thank you. Still to come, Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter reiterating many times this is still an active, ongoing investigation. We are not done stating that. He joins me after a quick break.
I'm glad that justice will be served, hopefully, and that that's what the news is, but a part of me will always have died with them that day, and a part of me will never fully find peace and justice. Nothing will ever be the same in Delphi, Indiana. Welcome back. We just heard from Mike and Becky Patty, the grandparents of Libby, who have been working with law enforcement at the center of this investigation, is Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter. Superintendent, it is good to have you on. It's great to see you. I know you have worked with the family. You have worked tirelessly to get this solved. But you say it's not a day to celebrate just yet, even though someone is in custody. Yeah, Susan, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. And I, I would also like to recognize Becky and, and Mike and, and Kelsey and Anna. I heard part of that interview a little while ago, and I just love them dearly. And I'm so proud of them, the way in which they're handling this. And you said that while you were driving in to make this announcement that everyone has been waiting for someone in custody, that you felt a sense of peace come over you. And when I heard that, I thought, that's really profound. I didn't expect that to happen. I, I didn't really know what I would feel, but uh, quite frankly, I pulled in that parking lot and I saw news outlets from around the country. And I, I just thought to myself, my gosh, they've stuck with us for all these years. And uh, I realized that today was, today was, a, was a somber day, but today was a good day. And it was, frankly, it was very peaceful. And I was there at the press conference April 22nd, 2019, and you said we've changed direction. We believe that you're local. We believe that you've been hiding in plain sight. And it appears that you are right. I know you can't talk about particulars of the investigation, but wow, were you dead on there? Well, again, I look forward to telling the country the story um, by presenting the facts to what we know versus what we think. And I say mm -hmm. that all the time. Uh, and then when one day I'll be able to talk about my personal feelings about that. But, um, Today's a good day for the city of Delphi and, I, and for the county and, and literally for the state and the nation. But I really hope that, that after today, people start healing just a bit, start trusting again and not worrying about every single thing um, like they've done up to this point. That's been very hurtful to see that happen. That's for us to worry about, not for our citizens, but it, it's certainly something that we couldn't prevent. And you have said over the past five and a half, almost six years, um, been on this that said, look, we're watching you. We will get you in terms of who is responsible for this. Also, uh, telling those out there, look, they're social media. We know that you're interested. Don't post side by sides. I mean, this has gotten national, international attention, as you have mentioned. It has. And it's been an extraordinary journey, quite frankly. And I, I think they're just a very small percentage of people that have tried to do this for a nefarious way, or maybe in a, in a nefarious way for nefarious reasons, maybe for self-motivation or, or self-gratification, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of people that did that were trying to do the right thing. And I, I really do believe that. So it's been a, it's been a partnership with so many different people uh, and lifelong relationships have been established. And something that stood out to me that you did say at that presser is you believe that good outweighs evil. Do you still believe that? I do. You know, very personally, be before my dad died, I he made me promise not to become cynical like him. And I was proud to report to him in 2018 that I'm not. And I'm still to this day, I'm, I'm not. Um, I really do believe after all these years in this business and seeing such horror and tragedy and, and the list was on and on and on, that good always, always comes through evil. And today's an example of that. And I, I was holding on to that. I still am, because when you see and you think about what Libby did, the bravery that you have spoken of and hitting record on her cell phone, getting the voice guys down the hill, you've seen much more than the public is privy to. Also, uh, that man, as we're looking at right now, his image and walking on the bridge, it, there was an outcry of, come on, get this guy. So you've been able to kind of uh, keep us in the know and also Right. As you mentioned, try to keep yourself above the fray and stay positive, too. You're human, as we all know. I am. I am. It's really <laughs> important. I'm, I, I've, got a, I've got a great seat on the bus, Susan, to watch such incredible people give of themselves for so many years. And I don't want anybody to think that, that this is all because of me. 
I, I, it's not even close to that. But I'm the luckiest guy in the world to be able to represent them. But what we can't do is, again, talk about what we think. We must talk about what we know. Mm -hmm. And now that charges have been filed against Allen, that the, the, time, the days of us talking about what we have are over. Right. And everything changes now. But I don't blame people for, the, for being frustrated. I don't blame them for wanting to know answers to their questions. But um, when I, every time I get those kinds of questions, I think of Mike and Becky and, and Kelsey and Anna and the community. And I'm not about to jeopardize the integrity of this by, by meeting a news cycle deadline or whatever that might be. But I want to maintain this partnership with our news outlets. And they have been wonderful. They really, really, really have. Sounds easy to do, not to go with what you think, but what you know. It is a difficult task, as we have seen. Superintendent Doug Carter, thank you. It's a pleasure. Good to be with you. Thanks. I want to bring in now Paul Holes, former cold case investigator, host of HLN's Real Life Nightmare, behind the arrest of the Golden State Killer. Paul, you know, we've been on a panel together speaking with the family. You've met them. What were your thoughts when watching that presser? Well, you know, obviously this is an amazing moment in this case. It's It's been a long time coming. I think, you know, kudos needs to go to Superintendent Carter, Indiana State Police, Carroll County Sheriff's Office for staying on top of it. You know, listening to Superintendent Carter, he obviously has a personal connection with the family with uh, Libby and, and, and Abby. So, you know, this, I, I completely understand the emotions he's going through. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to tell him, you know, you know, this is, even though this is a good moment in the case, in many ways, it's just the beginning. I've experienced that with the Golden State Killer. The trial's coming up. There's going to be a lot of challenges for him, his staff, and the family moving forward. Yeah, there is so many questions in terms of what led to this guy? What led to the arrest? Was your initial thought, this has got to be DNA? No, not necessarily. You know, most certainly DNA is a possibility if they reassessed evidence and found DNA that maybe was undiscovered before, then utilizing modern technology like genealogy could have led to this Allen, you know, he doesn't have any criminal history that would have him up in the FBI's CODA system. So they would have had to either resort to genealogy or have public tips come in, and then they were able to compare the DNA directly to him. Uh, there may be a situation where public tips did come in and they went and confronted him. He made incriminating statements. Maybe he confessed. We don't know that at this point. There's also the possibility that maybe there was a, a reservoir of digital gadget data that had been mm -hmm. undiscovered. And going back to it, they go, oh, here's a guy that is in the location on the day at the time uh, that the victims were there. So at this point, we just don't know. But there's pot, there's multiple possibilities of how they could have come across Allen. Yeah, we don't know because it is sealed at this point. Paul, a lot more to discuss. I know you're going to stick around. Coming up, the big question that came out of that press conference after the charges were announced, is Richard Allen the killer? Did he work alone? What led, as I just discussed, to his arrest? We're going to talk about it and much more with our expert panel. This is really important. While I know you are all expecting final details today concerning this arrest, today is not that day. Today is not that day. This investigation is far from complete, and we will not jeopardize its integrity by releasing or discussing documents or information before the appropriate time. Family members, the community have been waiting for the day to come, waiting, hoping for an arrest in the double murder of two young girls in 2017. It has been an unanswered question for close to six years. Who killed Abby and Libby? As police denounced murder charges for Delphi, Indiana resident Richard Allen, it seemed that day had come. But is this really it? Do police believe he is the killer? And if so, did he work alone? There are so many questions about Allen's arrest that remain unanswered. Police continue to ask for tips from the public, and they say more tips now. They're still coming in. 
are they looking for someone else in this case? My panel is with me. Expert panel, I want to start with former cold case investigator Paul Holes. Paul, do you think that they have their suspect, Richard Allen? Could he be the one and only person they're looking for and they're keeping this open because, hey, they want to solidify what will happen in the trial? Well, that's entirely possible. You have to consider that they developed probable cause for an arrest warrant that was reviewed by a prosecutor, reviewed by a judge. The prosecutor charged, decided to charge, based on the information, two counts of murder on Allen. And the prosecutor is not looking at this as doesn't meet the standard of probable cause. The prosecutor is going, can I convince a jury of 12 that is, it is beyond reasonable doubt now, they're, they're doing the right thing by holding back details on this case as they continue to flesh out this case. This case is so high profile, the last thing they want is media members going into the community with specific details on this case and starting to conduct interviews mm -hmm. and thereby contaminating a witness pool. Now, I know my assessment on this case, I believe there's a lone offender but I can't eliminate the possibility that maybe there's an accessory, maybe there's a second person present, and that's part of what the ongoing investigation is about. Now, I do want to go to HLN investigative producers, Barbara McDonald, Drew Iden. You both have followed this case as of we from the start. You were in the room today when they made that announcement. So what was your reaction when we finally heard, yes, someone is in custody? Not only are they in custody, they're from Delphi. You know, Susan, I think I think uh, one of the words that comes to mind is uh, is relief, uh, and I s especially think that that is uh, a feeling that was palpable from the folks here in town. Um, and you know, I, it's interesting because for six years, these folks in this town have been trying to prepare themselves for the knowledge that an arrest A was going to come and B could very well be someone local. Mm -hmm. And I still think that six years of preparing for that. Did not prepare them, That's and it's uh, it's interesting to talk to folks around town. Um, and so, you know, we talked to Cynthia Rossi, who, she, you know, we've talked to her throughout the podcast, Denise. and her. Or, I'm, yes, I'm sorry, Denise. And uh, Denise's uh, daughter Cynthia mm -hmm. was friends with Abby and Libby, and she talked about kind of learning about this arrest. Here's what she had to say. When I started to piece together who, and I saw his picture, and I had just talked to him a week before. I felt disgusted. I thought I was going to throw up. It was horrifying. <laughs> and how close he lives to my house. All his neighbors that are good friends of mine. He was a dog sitter for one of my good friends. They had no idea. Um, there's like a handful of stores in Delphi. He works at CVS. Everybody goes to CVS. So, you know, you can hear the trauma in her voice, and I think that it's it's important to remember there was obviously a trauma associated with this crime, and now there's a trauma for the acceptance that there's an arrest. Uh, and so I think this town is really doing the best that they can to learn that they now are taking kind of a left turn, and this is moving into a new phase. And Barb, what was it like being in the room there in the aftermath of what you heard? Uh, Susan, you know, one of the things I noticed was that uh, this press conference uh, was not a celebration, even though they're announcing an arrest, something that people have been waiting for. Um, Superintendent Carter said himself during the press conference, this is not a day to celebrate. Um, I kind of expected more fanfare at, at this when we got to this point, and it wasn't there, but I do understand they need to be very cautious. They need to be very measured with their words because we are entering another phase of this that's just as important as the first. Now they have to prove their case. And you both bring up excellent points in terms of what they thought they would feel and how they actually feel there. And it's just such a shift. I want to bring in Steve Moore, law enforcement analyst. Steve, all the information that led to this arrest, it is sealed. Were you surprised by that? 
Not at all. I mean, that's that's the one thing you would want to do immediately when you have a case that has so much um, specific evidence. There's a concept called culpable knowledge. And culpable knowledge means that there is information that is known only to the killer and the police. Say in this case, hypothetically, uh, he was eating a candy bar at some point and dropped, it, dropped a wrapper on the ground, say a Milky Way bar. Only the killer and the police would know that. So if you brought out the entire warrants, uh, set of warrants, if you brought out all the information and told everybody this, you could not use his knowledge that the candy bar wrapper was there and that it was a Milky Way. You know, absent it being published in the Indianapolis Star or something, that's information that only he has. And that becomes very powerful information in court. Steve, what's the strategy of announcing this on Friday and then waiting until Monday to make the announcement? That is, uh, I mean, I've seen people put people in on Friday just to get them off the street before a Monday arraignment. Uh, but why they didn't, I, I think basically you want your ducks in a row before you make statements to the to the press and they probably wanted him off the street sooner i mean right. obviously wanted him off the street sooner than later so you put him in and then you spend the weekend deciding what are we going to keep sealed what right. are we going to tell people plus you have probably a lot of family members to discuss to communicate mm -hmm. with and to notify you don't want them finding out from a press conference that their niece or their their nephew or their i'm sorry their aunt is is the one that's right. you don't want to find out that right there's so much to consider considering all of the attention so much to talk about with this expert panel more after the break Welcome back. We do want to let you know that we've put together a brand new episode of our podcast, Down the Hill, The Delphi Murders. Barbara McDonald, Drew Iden, and Dan Simitovich have just finished recording it. Head to your favorite podcast platform to download to get the latest information. Finally, an arrest and charges in the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German, just 13 and 14 years old, Abby and Libby, two teenage girls from Delphi, Indiana. I want to bring in our panel of experts. I want to get to Joey Jackson, attorney, HLN legal analyst. Joey, we keep hearing protecting the integrity of the investigation. So the probable cause document, that is sealed. Is that common? Yes, yeah, Susan, good evening to you. The bottom line here is that you want to seal that document because there's sensitive information and you don't want to impair the investigation. It's not common in as much as we see in a generalized prosecution, which lacks this public interest and is not unique like this one is. Generally, someone gets arrested, a probable cause document is provided, and we would all know and be able to examine and evaluate the evidence that's there. Just backing up briefly, probable cause is an important, I think, no, because we all wanted to know at the press conference today, Susan, yeah. what is the information specifically? You took items from the house. What specific items were there? What evidentiary value do they have? Is there forensic analysis or other things? We don't know that. But I get and understand why they did it very briefly. Why? Because you don't want to impair the rights of the defendant also. You can't condemn him. At this point, yes, he's arrested, but there's a far cry from an arrest to an actual conviction. That information will ultimately be challenged by defense attorneys. If it holds up, he'll be convicted by a jury. If it doesn't, that's another matter. Yeah, excellent point, Casey. Jordan, attorney, criminologist, HLN contributor. When you hear about the arrest, Richard Allen, and you think about it, 50 years old now, if he is guilty, mid-40s at the time, does someone just decide one day to do this, this brutal attack, brutal murder of two young girls. Could he have done something like this in the past? Will they look into it? Oh, they're definitely looking into it. Now, let's just kind of regroup because there is so much that we don't know, but mm -hmm. let's uh, assume that the murderer um, did not really plan it. it he probably had a very rich fantasy life and had been thinking about doing terrible things like this to young girls for quite a while. But on that day, in broad daylight, in a public setting, this would have been an act of impulsivity, most likely. And 
afterwards, I've interviewed many killers who say in the days afterwards, they are full of panic. They are convinced everyone's going to know. They're expecting the police to come around the corner at any time and arrest them. But when that doesn't happen, they calm down mm -hmm. and then they just play the routine role. Now, if he moved out of town, what would he tell his wife? If he quit his good job at CVS, how would that look to the neighbors, the people that he's, he's dog sitting for? His best routine was to act like nothing was going on, keep the job, keep the house, keep the wife, don't do anything radical, and it worked for him for five years. So like everybody else, I'm really interested in knowing what exact evidence they have that led to this arrest because he has been hiding in plain sight the entire time. Exactly. The FBI, Casey, posted a flyer asking for the public's help, posted it in many locations, including the CVS store where Richard Allen worked day in and day out, saw it all the time. He is, of course, presumed innocent. But what are your thoughts on the fact that he stayed there in Delphi, as you mentioned? Well, think about what would have happened if he went into the pharmacy to work and he saw the poster that the FBI put up, I think, on the door. I think it was probably posted right mm -hmm. over his shoulder in the pharmacy area. What would you think if your coworker is taking that down, especially given how the community has really, really rallied around this investigation? I mean, we're... How would that look? Uh, if you take the flyer down, if you say, hey, I want to transfer to a CVS in a whole different state, mm -hmm. mostly the fact that we know he, he lives in that house with his wife, what do you tell your spouse about why you suddenly want to up and leave, why you're taking flyers down? That would be consciousness of guilt. Mm -hmm. So it had to be unnerving for him to have those flyers all around with a sketch that looks almost exactly like him. Uh, but all he had to do was play it cool, lay low, just yeah. go through his regular routine. Don't take flyers down. Um, and and again, uh, nobody, he wasn't on anyone's radar that I know of other than the police. Absolutely not. Very brazen. Jean Casares, HLN correspondent. So let's say go sit in the next stage, as we heard from Superintendent Doug Carter, that we are going into that stage. And considering um, the jury pool, Delphi being less than 3,000 people, and also I want to discuss murder in terms of first degree, second degree. There's just murder in the state of Indiana. Loaded question, but first, are you able to find a jury when it goes to trial? You know, I think that's an important question, and I think that may be one reason why they did the extraordinary thing, I believe, in sealing the charging document. The probable cause affidavit, it is routinely sealed because it has so much information in it. The charging document, and of course, maybe Indiana is different, but it's normally the name, date of birth, and the statute of the crime that they are being charged with. You don't get a lot of information usually in this, but they, I am sure, want this case tried in Delphi. This is their case, mm -hmm. their community. They don't want to have to go to another part of Indiana. So they want the evidence in a pristine form. And they don't want, as someone else said, they don't want potential witnesses um, really to the point where they're not going to give credible testimony because so much information is out. Absolutely. And I know, Jean, you've covered uh, cases like this for years or similar. Have you ever seen an investigation where law enforcement makes the families wait three full days before announcing information to the press? Nothing in this case has seemed, quote unquote, normal. I know. I know. It's so true what you're saying. You know, on the one hand, it's so wonderful that they care about the victims' families, and they go to them, and they talk to them. Because more and more, you're seeing in, in some respects that law enforcement doesn't consider the victims anymore. They just start doing what they want to do. That's what I've seen evolve in the last uh, several decades. So I think it's wonderful in that sense. And yes, the public had to wait to hear this until now, but at least the families knew. They're most important of all. Absolutely. I do want to thank everyone on our expert panel. So do appreciate your expertise on this. Still to come, investigators spent hours at the home of Richard Allen in mid-October. We're going to dive into the exclusive photos taken outside with our investigative producer, Just Ed. This guy, I just, it just breaks my heart. So many families are affected by this. And um, I feel bad for his family and his friends. And, but I'm glad justice is going to be served, I hope. 
getting input from the town of Delphi, Indiana, less than 3,000 residents hoping for this day. Investigators were outside of the home of suspect Richard Allen in mid-October. They were there for many hours, and we have exclusive photos only on HLN taken outside of his home that day. Want to go back to Delphi, HLN investigative producer Barbara McDonald. Barbara, walk us through these photos and what we're seeing. That's right, Susan. I was able to speak with some of the neighbors of Richard Allen. They've lived uh, near him for several years. They were familiar with him, but didn't know him well. But on Thursday, October 13th, they noted, noticed a lot of activity outside his house, a lot of cars that appeared to them to be unmarked law enforcement vehicles, a lot of men not in law enforcement uniforms, but in suits and khaki pants, all arriving at the house just before noon. They asked Richard and his wife to exit the home and to remain outside of the home throughout the day. They weren't allowed back into the home until around 11 p.m. that night. During that time, Richard stood outside. Uh, his wife sat in a van. He stood outside that van for several hours. One of the photos shows that, that we've exclusively obtained. Another photo shows him sitting in the van with his wife, with the passenger door open for another several hours. At some point, as it was starting to get dark out, this, uh, these neighbors noticed that uh, the Carroll County Sheriff's Chief Deputy Tony Liggett arrived. He had a piece of paper with him. He showed it to Richard Allen. And at that point, a tow truck arrived and started taking the car away, one of uh, the cars away, not the one he'd been sitting in, but a car that the neighbors recognized as one that he routinely used. And uh, they began a search inside the house and also in the yard using some sort of a device, perhaps like a metal detector or something like that, to search a flower bed and also an area around a shed. They did dig around the shed, some small areas. They took a lot of photos in the shed. Um, the neighbors also watched through binoculars as officers came out of the house carrying several bundles of cloth, dark cloth, perhaps clothing, a Macy's shopping bag, a shoebox, and a stack of books, small books. Wow. And uh, at this point, we don't know what any of that means for the investigation. That is something that I'm sure investigators have spent the last several weeks uh, looking for whatever evidence perhaps led them to today. And uh, the neighbors said that they had known him for several years and he was basically, there was nothing special about him. He lived a quiet life with his wife and uh, didn't have loud parties, didn't have a lot of people over. They spoke to them on occasion, but not often. And uh, they're quite unnerved by these developments. Yeah, Susan. that is what is so baffling. And you were able, as you mentioned, to speak to the neighbors and get those pictures and the neighbors through binoculars thinking, who is this? We didn't even know our neighbor. And you mentioned that yeah. shed in the back. Yes. And that's right. And, and they said that, you know, they'd never in their lives ever seen that type of activity in their neighborhood or anywhere else that they've ever lived. Uh, it was a lot of vehicles, perhaps uh, eight to 12 vehicles they saw. One of them did appear to be a crime scene type white utility van. And uh, it took 12 hours all told, uh, many of those hours seemingly waiting for a search warrant. Wow. Barbara McDonald, thank you for those photos and speaking to the neighbor. Casey, quickly here, what does that tell you? The neighbors had no idea. Well, again, hiding in plain mm -hmm. sight. Um, again, it's, it, it's the roots to the community that can be the best disguise when somebody is guilty of a crime. We see this all the time, per, per, particularly with serialists, people who commit a number of crimes. And by definition, when somebody commits a number of crimes like this, they're successful in it. They keep getting away with it by just looking normal, going through their normal routine. You can be very sure that the police are going to consider that perhaps he has done this sort of crime in the past. And maybe that is what this investigation into his house is about. Remember, we don't know if he took souvenirs from Abby and Libby. We don't know exactly what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. But it would seem that what they found there is responsible for his arrest on Friday. Well said. I'd like to thank our entire panel tonight for their expertise. I know we all are thinking about the family and hoping for justice for Abby and Libby. Thanks so much for being with us. Good night.